on a Thursday. It's always good to have fellowship and see the things, all the people said. Amen. Tonight, I'd like to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Became a favorite subject of mine in 1997. The title is, Let's Talk About Jesus. I think it's probably everybody's favorite topic, isn't it? So when, once we receive the Holy Spirit, definitely he became a very important part of our lives, and we all surely can rejoice in that. Um, sorry, I'm looking for a, there we go. Bobby said 45 minutes. When I see you nodding off, we'll call it a day. That was my first bad dad joke. We'll try to keep it to a minimum. <laughs> okay, I deserve that. I did. I did. I did deserve that. All right. So um, simply, um, I'd like to start with, if you were asked a question, um, who Jesus is, how would you answer that? And I thought, just in thinking of that question, um, there's a lot of different religions and people claim that different things that are their religion, they can tell you about it. I'm sure if you asked, I don't know much about other religions. I've never studied them. So, um, but just think about what would be your answer? How would you describe who Jesus is? Um, I know a lot of us could probably pick out some wonderful titles, Lord, Teacher, Father, Messiah, Holy One, the Savior of the world. Uh, we sing about King of Kings, the Prince of Peace. Um, he has a lot of wonderful titles, but again, if we struck up that conversation, how would we describe our Lord and Savior? Um, so I kind of want to look at a little bit of a little bit of history and a little bit of mystery. And no, that's not in there. A little bit of history and um, um, some well-known scriptures. So um, if you could turn to Isaiah 53. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a little nervous tonight, but um, so I'm making bad jokes. So I'll try and lay off the bad jokes at least. Um, we know as saints that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? We know this. And when you really start thinking about yesterday, yesterday has no end. Yesterday keeps going. It keeps going. Today is a beautiful day to dwell with the Lord, right? All the people said, amen. And forever has no end. So Jesus was here before time, and when time stops, he will continue to move forward, okay? And so very all-encompassing. As, as early as Genesis 3, and um, I got to put the disclaimer out there, I did not, I really tried to stay away from Google search on how many prophecies there are about Jesus Christ in the Bible. And I'm, you may know, and I don't correct me, I don't want to know. Um, I haven't read them all, or maybe I haven't haven't understood them, but as early as Genesis, Jesus is prophesied about. And now if we look at God's great week, that could be somewhere around 6,000 years ago, or or if you do look at Google, it could be 300,000 years ago. Well, so we know that since as early as God came on the scene, as early as God was moving, which is the beginning, Jesus was prophesied about. He was talked about. What I kind of want to get to in Isaiah, Isaiah was around around 700 BC, um, historically, and his writings came about. Um, he was a prophet. And in looking at Isaiah 53, you guys are all there. It's probably some of the most, probably one of the most um, profound prophecies of Jesus Christ. Um, to give you an idea, around this time between five, 700 BC and 500 BC, the Babylonian War had come up, was in that time for, period of 200 years. Um, the destruction of Solomon's Temple, okay, the sieges of Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar, plural, and uh, very close to the time when um, the Israelites were allowed to come back into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Okay, so so here is Isaiah, and obviously if uh, if Isaiah and he probably did have a pretty good idea and understanding what was going on. He knew that that the children of Israel um, were were far from far from right with God. They were more looking to um, being right with other nations. They were more looking to how can they appease themselves in positions of stature and authority. And they weren't looking to having God on a pedestal as their savior. Um, so 
you know, even if you look at the, the laws that were that were written for them to follow, they were not following them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been taken into captivity and slavery. God wouldn't have done that if they were on the right track. So in Isaiah 53, as we read through this, own the scriptures, because this, these scriptures are, are about you. And as I read them, I found it very humbling. I found it very deep, very powerful. Um, not to be taken lightly that, wow, someone spoke about Jesus 700 years ago, or actually a little more, that was 700 years before Christ, so do the math. I'm not very good at that. 20, almost 3,000 years ago, thank you. Sorry, I need to take my shoes off to do that kind of math. Um, I lose fingers and eat toes. So, praise the Lord. Um, but own these scriptures. I mean, own them, because our Lord and Savior died for us, and he died for us so that he could give us the Holy Spirit so that we could continue in his stead. And that's a very powerful, it's very sober, very humbling thing. So in verse 2, we'll pick it up. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So obviously you can tell that at this time, you know, when he's prophesied about Jesus, that when Jesus was to come, he was going to be a tender plant. He was going to be something that sprung up and think about, you know, if maybe Tammy can really relate with her greenhouse when those plants start springing up and then the flowers come and then the fruit starts to come. It's just beautiful. You know, you rejoice in that. And he gives a root out of a dry ground. And that's very telling to the times of Israel that there was no river of life flowing there there was no springs flowing up with with god's word the people were drinking from the stagnant waters okay they had they had rejected him and we'll talk about that also he wasn't beautiful he wasn't like we see you know if you go to any of the christian stores nice flowing locks you know beautiful hair perfect face um and verse three says he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And when I when I read those scriptures, it really makes me think of like a homeless person that we pass on the road, and, and we can try and think of all their issues they're dealing with, but think of that person that's that's sitting there disheveled, old clothes not in a good way that's how jesus was looked out okay that's how jesus was taken okay i mean i'm just trying to give you a visual representation to understand how he was looked upon when he was here you know we i think we heard in a talk recently one one moment they're they're praising him and singing hosanna and putting palm fronds and and the next minute they're saying crucify him you know let the, let the let the thief be be let go so continuing surely he hath borne our griefs own that, own that, carried our sorrows. Yet we, everybody in this room, we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Own, own those scriptures because it's very powerful what our Lord and Savior did for us in dying on the cross. It's not a simple thing. And God made this wonderful plan that was thousands of years in the making. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So we can see that all the things that we did wrong and, and, and continue to do wrong, because we make mistakes. And it's the spirit that continues to teach us and guide us into all truth and knowledge, all wisdom. You know, all those sins, the ones that we were forgiven of when we received the Holy Spirit and the ones we're committing today and the ones we're going to commit tomorrow, all those sins were, were laid to the cross in that moment. And with his stripes, we are healed. And I love that we, we pray for one another, and, and I really appreciate the prayer for my shoulder. And no, Je Josh, I don't want a rough house with anybody, especially not you. You're a big guy, you know. <laughs> Pick on someone your own size. You ever heard that one? <laughs> I mean, praise the Lord. <laughs> um, but... With his stripes, we are healed, but that was talking about a transgression and a, and a parting between the people and God. 
And that was healed at that moment when, when the Lord was taken up into glory and his spirit was poured out, that was healed. And with his stripes, we are healed. We pray for victories, we pray for healings, and we fervently expect them and we rejoice when we get them. I love, Tammy had a, had a wonderful testimony about her, her, I don't say diabetes, right? And she's praying about it, right? And the Lord brings someone to show her how to deal with it. And I've had situations like that. And it's beautiful because sometimes I struggle, like, how come I'm not getting this miraculous healing? Well, that's just not what God wants to give at that time. It doesn't mean that it's not a victory or, or a wonderful blessing. It was. It is a beautiful testimony. And all the people said, amen. All right, we'll continue. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so again, we just see like, look, we're, we're, we're sheep, man. If you don't put a fence around the sheep or you don't have a sheep dog or a sheep herder or a shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Okay. The sheep will scatter. And, and we've gone astray. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We can all rejoice that the Lord's brought us together. We've got a wonderful foundation here in Seattle. We're rejoicing in that. We expect good things to happen and they are happening. They are happening. Every time we go out, we see someone come in. Every time we go out, see, see someone coming in. And so, um, Again, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He brought, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his, her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And we know that he didn't revile as he was being crucified that day. He didn't, he didn't talk back and, and we've heard how many legions of angels, I think it was a total of 80 some thousand legions. And we've heard talks about what one angel can do and how powerful that, that would have been all for a purpose, all for a plan. And so when Jesus brought his message, all those angels were still in waiting and he could have started, how do they say the windshield wiper and the, no, he could have, he could have very easily at that time while he was here laid waste to the iniquity, to the immorality, to the false idols, the false gods, but he came with something even more powerful, a wonderful word that we share with each other quite frequently called love. And he brought a very wonderful love to, to mankind, one that, that is full of compassion full of mercy, full of grace. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but we'll keep moving on. He was taken from, from prison and from judgment. And, the, and this one, I just want you to really think about for a moment, because we're doing a great job here, but there's always more, right? And who shall declare his generation? So who is Jesus to us? Who is he? You know, think about that conversation we're called to go into the world and preach the gospel, to share the good news, right? Not to get caught up in all this silly stuff, share the good news. For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So he paid a great price for us, an endearing price. And then that one little question pops up at the very end there. Who shall declare his generation? Okay. Let's move on. Let's go to John 1. So beautiful, beautiful um, prophecy there. And I, I, I truly, you know, every time I read that, it just becomes even more powerful. You know, uh, you know, he first loved us. And, and, you know, it's like when we were yet dead in our trespasses and sins, he looked upon us with, with compassion and, and mercy and grace. Okay. And now... He's given us so much life, and what shall we do with it? What shall we do with it? Okay. And you guys got, got to John 1. I just said John 1, right? I said John 3. You're cheating. Someone looked at my clock. We will go to John 3, but I get it. Um, in John 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. So again, just, just a, a powerful confirmation. Here's John stating these simple things in the first chapter that he's writing about. 
prophecies from thousands of years earlier, prophecies from hundreds of years earlier, and now the Messiah is on the scene. And and he said, look, this is him. This is the one, okay? And so if you want to flip over to John 3, one facet I do want to look at a little bit tonight, um, one description, I guess, is Jesus as a teacher. And I, I think, you know, I often say it's just wonderful to sit at the throne of grace and mercy and, and learn from him. And he continues to teach us all daily, whether it's through our prayer life or reading times or fellowship or meetings or or just the things he shows us, okay? And, and it's just a wonderful place to be. In John 3, verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And I'm not going to go into it, but we know that he goes on and gives him the, the wonderful message we all have come to know so well about being born again. And um, one thing I kind of want to, you don't need to go there, but in Matthew 4, I just want to bring out, we know you're a teacher come from God. That, that even, even the Pharisees, Nicodemus, the rulers of the time, they, they're hearing seeing things, they're hearing testimony of what Jesus is doing. And he says, so we know you're a teacher come from God. You have a message. One of the first, I, I like Matthew, and don't go there, but Matthew 4, 17, um, says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now think about the legions of angels. I mean, he could have just started casting judgment. He could have said, line them up, line them up. This is not working. We know that there was a great flood. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah paid a price. So when I look at that word repent, I don't look at it as a, a heavy word. I don't look at it as a, as a repent or perish. It's a change your ways and follow me. What you're doing is not working. It's not bringing you joy. It's not bringing you peace. It's not bringing you happiness. It's not bringing you love. Change your ways. Follow me. If you want to go to Matthew 5, what I want to look at tonight, besides those wonderful scriptures in Isaiah, and I'm sure we all love those scriptures, all the people said, amen, beautiful scriptures. Um, I want to look at the Beatitudes. I don't know why they're called the Beatitudes. Somebody named them that. I was going to Google that, but I didn't think it was important. <laughs> um, sure. Yes. I'm not even going to go there. It's going to make me laugh. Um, anyway, let's get busy, get serious. Matthew 5, verse 1. So the Beatitudes, when I was reading through these, and again, own them. Own them because he was talking to you. He was talking to each and every one of us when he when he was speaking these things. Um, he wasn't trying to tell the sinner how to get saved, which he kind of was, because it's us. He was telling us how we ought to behave, how we ought to be, how we ought to interact. Kind of like a job description. If you look at a lot of those, you know, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They shall inherit the earth. You know, they shall have mercy. They shall be called the children of God. Is that not us? It's us. He's talking to us. Um, I did look at Britannica. I, I, sometimes I need a little help. Uh, so uh, can I say I, I can't even say that word no more. Sorry. Thank you. Beatitudes. Can I go with that one? Is anyone, please. Sorry. Uh, named from the initial word words, beati sunt. And if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, sorry, meaning blessed are. Of those sayings in the Latin Vulgate Bible, which I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with that, the Beatitudes describe the blessedness of those who have certain qualities or experiences peculiar to those belonging to the kingdom of heaven. I thought that was really kind of cool. Those who have certain qualities or experiences peculiar to those belonging to the kingdom of heaven. So I'm like, yeah, that's definitely us. So we'll pick it up in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for, the, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Simple definition of poor, 
I, I'm, I mean, not having what others commonly have. And so if you think about being poor in spirit, that, you know, every one of us can give our testimony and speak very briefly about what our lives were like before we received the Holy Spirit. And that would be probably a very good definition. Verse four, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Very simply, right? We do have times when, when things are disheartening and we know that we have the comforter. Um, and we know that as brothers and sisters, there are times when we can pray and comfort one another or even others in this world, we've called to give the comforter unto them, to share with them. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek, quiet and gentle. And, and again, I thought about, I thought about Jesus and, and the ability to summon how many legions of angels, you know, 80 some thousand angels, depending on how many you think was in a legion. It's like quiet, and gentle. He came with soft words of, of love and, and exhortation, encouraging mankind to turn away from this untoward generation, as Peter would, would call it. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And usually Wednesdays and Sundays are pretty good. All the people said, amen. And we hear some good stuff and we, we continue on. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Merciful, showing and giving mercy, compassion, compassion. Uh, each, each and every one of us, how we heard the word, how we were witness to, <laughs> we hear Cassie, she's hiding. We hear Cassie, all the little rat bags. We were like original rat bags. You know, before we received the Holy Spirit, we were, you know, probably pretty unsavory folk. Um, you know, from... And the Lord had mercy and compassion on us. He saw into our hearts and he saw the people that, that we are. And he called unto us and we answered. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we constantly remind ourselves every Sunday about what Jesus Christ did dying on the cross and, and, and having his body brutally broken in our stead and having his blood shed in our stead. Okay, And we remember that and it purifies us. Holding on to that purifies us because that's that's one of the most powerful things, if not the most powerful act of love mankind has ever known. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Peacemaker, one who brings about peace, reconciling adversaries. I mean, I thought like, you know, how many people are adversary against God for whatever reason? And, and you know, we, we're dealing with all the... I don't even know how to describe it. The, the gender things in this world today are very disturbing, at least, at the least, but everything is adversary against God. Everything is trying to disprove and push him away. Well, we're called to be peacemakers, to be reconciling these adversaries. And how do we do that, right? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, I'm sure we've all experienced that at times. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You know, often, oftentimes I, I, when things get tough, I just think the Lord's gone through this and much worse. And he, and he did it on my behalf. So it gives me strength, you know, and the word is there to do that for us. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So it doesn't matter. We don't have to, we don't have to sharpen our swords. And you know, if we look at in Ephesians where you got the spiritual armor and talks about the sword and the shield and helmets and, and the battle we go into is against principalities and powers. No, it's against spiritual wickedness. So we're not physically taking a fight to people. We're here to bring love. Okay. So one thought I had, and we're kind of winding down. If you want to turn to Matthew 5, we're going to close there. But we're already in Matthew 5, huh? Uh, we're going to go down the page a little bit. So I was thinking about the sower of the seeds, right? And the parable of the sower and the seed, that's in Matthew 13. You can read that on your own. Really good stuff. So I just thought to myself, if I went out into the street here on, I think it's 3rd Avenue or 169, or just think of a busy road, and you just started throwing seed out there. I mean, whatever kind of seed you want to call it. I mean, whatever seed, um, flowers, fruit, whatever seed. You just throw it on the, on the ground. 
you know, the cars are going to be running over it. The wind from the vehicles is going to push it off the side. You, you, you might have it find a crack and then it sprouts up and the car takes care of it. Or it gets going on the side of the road and the road department comes by and sprays weed killer on it. It's not going to make it. Or if we threw some seed out in the parking lot, got all that gravel out there and cars coming and going. So it's uh, very, very unlikely. But the heart, if we cultivate the heart of people God is bringing into us with love, we get to know them. We get to understand what they're going through. When they start to trust us and open their heart, then the seed will get planted. Then the seed will get planted. We don't want to just cast it lightly to the streets and in the parking lot. We can do that. We can, I don't mean, how many pamphlets did we get? Quite a few. We could go scatter them to the wind. And, and, and there's a distinct possibility. We have testimonies in the fellowship that someone will come along. And the Parkers got thrown in the Bible and the Lord moved them to come along. But for us, when people are coming in, we would just want to make sure that that we are helping to cultivate that that seed deeply, understanding where they're coming from, understanding who they are and their plight, because they were just like us. They were lost. They were lost. In Second Corinthians three, it says, uh, "You yourselves are a letter of recommendation." This is the Amplified. It's our credentials written in your hearts to be known, perceived, and recognized, and read by everybody, okay? So it's not about sharpening our sword and, and, and putting it to people. Something has attracted them to come along. Something has attracted them just like it did each and every one of us to, to listen to what's being said, whether you hear it in the gifts, a talk. We don't need to sharpen our swords on, on people coming along. We need to cultivate that love. The same love and compassion that Jesus had that said is a calling card for us, compassion towards their plight. In verse 46 of chapter 5, we're going to close here. It says, for if you love them with lo which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not the, even the publicans so? Do not... Do not even the public and so. So it's not, verse 48, be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He didn't come with swords. He didn't come with weapons of warfare. He came with the most powerful weapon of all, love, compassion, understanding looking into people's hearts and, and, and seeing their, their emptiness and their hurt and their pain. We have a comforter to give them. We have something beautiful. The world can understand it, and it's our job to show it to them. All people say. With that, we'll turn over to uh, Brother Bobby.